wonder where's it going to go in the future, and that really goes back to education. So I'm going to try to tell some stories, and you can pick little tidbits out about it that refer to education. I'll talk about my own teaching experiences as well. Um, what a great introduction this was. I mean, I love technologists to begin with because to me, I just decided I wanted to be one my whole life and not a businessman. So I'm the opposite of government, but I'm very much technology. Came here to Sacramento, there's a group outside, you know, protesters for this group dam. Mothers Against Dyslexia. <laughs> Scares, I solved one of the big riddles and problems. I figured out where global warming comes from. The Cold War's over. <laughs> well, fortunately, I was inspired to value education highly by my parents and my father and my mother. They would teach me flashcards before the other kids, and I'd be a math star in school and know the answers before the girls did, and I was getting famous for that. And, and when, a, you know, and when a teacher gives you good feedback, you feel, whoa, that's what I'm going to be in life. School is good. I love it. I'm good at it. You know, whether you're shy or not. And other inspirations come from TV shows and movies and books. And I would read books about Tom Swift Jr. And be inspired by, whoa, this guy's an engineer. He owns a company with his father. He goes into the laboratory and he builds plasma fields to entrap aliens he's detected with some radio. Wow, that was exciting. You know, you don't have that many of the technology heroes to look up to today. You hear about most of them in the sense of just business, and it's kind of dry, and it's not the thing that kids really get inspired by. So uh, we've got some things going on in this, this country that help to inspire kids to be, to favor math and science and technology and keep it going. And we in California should be especially um, concerned about that. When I grew up, we had a lot of electronic kids, so we shared the hobby of learning this little thing called electronics, how to wire parts together and make them, you know, do things, flashlights or make sounds that were strange or house-to-house -house intercoms, and, um, and, you know, that was just inspiring. We felt we had a specialist. We were out there doing something the others weren't. That became very important, real important direction in life that all of us to this day that started out that way are working in technology. And we had, you know, the other people in school might not know what we're doing, but we don't care. It's our little thing that makes us special. And, and then again, it's okay to be an outsider, okay to be a geek or a nerd or shy or not accepted by the others. And science fair projects, NASA, government, uh, you know, entity, NASA, they've always been sponsoring science fairs, you know, and so many other types of contests and education in the areas of science. And I built projects for the science fair that were so much huger and so much more work to get a complete project done with 100 switches and 100 lights and doing different things. That Those are the things I remember much more than my other school projects. You know, working on long, hard projects in, to get you kind of trained for the diligent work it takes to solve the real complicated problems of the world. You have to have a lot of patience and a lot of diligence and work for a long time on those sort of things. So it's good to have a start when you're young. A lot of your ideals and your goals when you're young are the ones that persist and take you to solving those problems for the rest of the world when you're older. I remember in sixth grade telling my dad, I want to be an engineer like you. And I said, second, I want to be a fifth grade teacher like Miss Sprague. And I said, the teachers, you know, he taught me how we were the one, the future of the world, learning to make a better world than our parents had. And I said, well, do these teachers get paid more than engineers? I didn't know. He said, no. I was disappointed by that, and, and uh, I'll get back to this at the end of my speech, but uh, I said, oh, do the elementary school teachers at least get paid more than college professors? <laughs> um, I had, um, you know, you, we all have a couple of outstanding teachers that reach to us personally, but I had one less that he reached to me personally, although he did, but more he was just an incredibly great teacher. Came from a military background, pretty much whatever the school system is, he was going to do a great program in spite of it. And he would write his own courseware rather than buy books. He had the, st the students, the first few years of the school, build the tech equipment. It was an electronics class, and they would build the oscilloscope one year, and they would build a signal generator. So by the year that I got there, we had a complete lab for everyone to use to learn electronics and test the radios and televisions as we built them and disassembled them and repaired them. And, um, now, I knew all the electronics. I had a ham radio license since uh, sixth grade. I was sort of a protege that way. And Mr. McComb said, well, Steve, I've, I've got this engineer at a company who will let you go down to the company and program a computer. And I would go down to Sylvania in Sunnyvale once a week and program a computer. We didn't have computers in high school. Computer science was beyond rocket science in those days. 
It's like where you'd never see a computer in your life, maybe. They might be in some weird research things. You never saw them in the newspaper, so they just weren't common. And I got to go down and program a computer that could do one million operations a second. <laughs> so incredible, you know, and a normal human being can only do maybe one thing a second. So I had the world, I was a superman. I was so much more powerful than anyone else. And I went down and wrote my first program in the Knights Tour to jump a knight on the chessboard, hitting every square exactly once. And when you get stuck, you back up and try a different move and back up a few moves and try different ones. And it's called a backtracking algorithm. And it just flashed the lights. And then finally I did a calculation that it would take 10 to the 25th years to get a solution. <laughs> Longer than the universe. Well, a million things a second and it couldn't solve a relatively simple problem compared to many in the world. And one thing that taught me was you need the human mind to come up with the good approaches, the good algorithms, the good methods to solving these sort of problems. And raw speed of a computer won't do it by itself. Um, while I was down there programming a computer in high school, I saw a manual that described a real computer. And I was very shy by this point in time. I knew that I wanted to understand more and more about computer technology. I had done some incredible science fair projects, right up to building, you know, ones and zeros and binary adders and subtractors. But I didn't really know what a computer was exactly. And now I had a manual that described all the holding places in the computer for ones and zeros. And what some of the ones and zeros told the other ones and zeros to do and it was called the Small Computer Handbook. Now, I had experience designing what's called logic from my elementary school science fair projects. So I took the chip books of the day, and I started working alone on paper, just myself, just trying to find the solution. It wasn't a class in school. How can I combine these little parts to make this big thing called a computer? I started designing my own computer, and then I found ways to get manuals for all the mini computers that were coming out in the late 1960s. And over and over and over, it's really a method of attaining excellence. I was trying to do design every computer that was made and then redesign it on a spare weekend. I would shut my door. My father was locked out. My, my friends were locked out. Nobody in school knew what I was doing. I just did it because this was my thing in life that I loved. I would never do it as a job. I never wanted to. I didn't think they had jobs in computers. But I was designing computer after computer after computer over and over, trying to make my designs better. How do you make your design better? For me, it was a simple formula, if I could do it with fewer parts. And I came to love everything in life, to be so simple and direct. I really like it, it, it really helps um, the mind be nice and free too, although it's very hard to design this kind of stuff. I just wanted mine to be better than anyone else in the world. And that's the sort of excellence that creates the products that really will change things. In, um, in the high school, I told my dad, someday I'm gonna own a 4K Nova computer. That was, that was the minimum computer that could run a programming language. I wanted to sit down like my next tour program, type programs into some teletype or something, and run them on a computer. And that was a computer to me, and I would have one someday. And Dad said, it costs as much as a house. And I was stunned. I didn't realize how much they cost. And I said, well, I'll live in an apartment. <laughs> It might have been a little competition with my dad, but I was determined from that point on that I was going to have my own computer someday in my life, no matter what. Um, yeah, and, we're in, okay, and we're in school, and we're going along. One of the things that I discovered in school is you're measured by your grades. And the definition of intelligence is, have you read the same words as everyone else? And can you repeat them and say the same things as everyone else? And that's really kind of the follower, if you saw the Steve Jobs quote, it's the follower mentality. You know, and it's really not, I'm going to think, maybe these words are wrong, maybe there's questions, maybe if I got different input, it might be really different than what's said. Even the current events, it's who's read the same headlines, who's watched the same TV shows, we all know what to say, because they've told us what to say. And I really wanted to be independent. Read, I read Thoreau back in those days, and wanted to think things out for myself, and be very resourceful, and use my own intellect and my own resources to build things. Um, so I decided I was going to just be independent. And you know what? The fact that somebody else was doing something else in life and felt it was important didn't bother me if I felt differently or I wanted to do something that was different. Um, I didn't, if, I, you don't have to convince everybody. You don't have to argue. And really coming up with that sort of formula was one of the greatest things to giving me the peace of happiness, which is the true measure of life. Not how many yachts you have, not what kind of a title you have, not how many companies you started. It's really how many times have you laughed in your life. So I had that formula long before Apple. 